Hello, everyone. It's October the 18th. Uh, tomorrow, October the 19th, is my mom's birthday. And uh, I can't tell you how much, you know, I miss my mom and dad. And, but today, we've lost a true, true, true mega American hero, a four-star general. Colin Powell, an absolute champion in every way, 84 years old, and really and truly died with COVID. How many, how many of our heroes, how many of our mentors, how many of our parents, how many of those that really have given us so much wisdom, it's unbelievable, are we going to lose? But uh, this one is really and truly our nation's hero in many, many ways. I'm going to read to you just a few things, but 84 years old, a man that really led by kindness and logic and sternness and truth and trust. All those things. He didn't lead because he just had a title. He led because he led out of uh, compassion and love and right and absolute strength. More than anything, out of trust and truth. You know, I could not possibly admire someone with those qualities anymore. That's all there is to it, because I think that that's what it's all about, right there. You know, if you represent truth, and you create bonds, and you create trust, you're able to lead people to be able to surpass their wildest dreams of what they could do, and what they could achieve. You know, in a grain of sand way compared to this great man. This is exactly what I've tried to do through my life. And, uh, and I can tell you that we lost a superstar beyond superstars right here. So please join everyone in this nation in prayer for this great man, all that he gave to each and every one of us. And all of us should join in appreciation and prayer for this great effort and all the wisdom that this man brought us. So for all of his family and all those that loved him so dearly, I pray, I pray with all in me that God will have a tremendous helper by his side right now. And absolutely, this is a true superstar that we lost. Now, we've got a testimonial today from a fellow, Christopher Holmes. And Christopher is from Sissonville. And Christopher is wanting to share his story about, about his battle with COVID. And so uh, I think if we've got Christopher, we'll do Christopher right now, and then we'll get on to our other business. All right. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the good Lord above. Uh, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here to be able to share my story. Um, I'd like to thank uh, CMAC uh, Hospital for their, their doctors and their nurses was were awesome. Um, a little bit about me. I'm 44 years old. Uh, I've been married for 21 years. I have a daughter and a son. Um, in early June, uh, my whole family uh, ended up sick. Uh, other than my daughter, she's the only one that had the COVID shot. Uh, my wife, my son, and my daughter's boyfriend, we all ended up with COVID. Um, I kept getting worse and worse. So I ended up on June 14th, I went into the hospital. And uh, from there, um, I just kept getting worse. Um, they had to put me on the vent. Uh, they had to put me on the, the ECMO machine. I pretty much had hoses sticking out of every hole in my body. 
I had a feeding tube. Um, the hoses that uh, from the ECMO machine, they had to put two holes in my neck. My daughter said they was probably the size of garden hoses. Um, they had to put a trach in me so I could breathe, and I'll have that scar for the rest of my life. Um, it was uh, it was tough. Uh, I was there for eighty days. I um, uh, I had to take a total of one hundred and sixty shots in my stomach for uh, for blood clots. Um, it was tough on my family. My family, uh, one minute, one day that I, I'd be doing great. The next minute, the doctor would tell her that I wasn't going to make it. Um, and I have proof, uh, of myself that's the, the COVID shot works because everyone had COVID in my house except my daughter. And she was the only one that had the COVID shot. Um, the, uh, it was, you know, when you come and think about it, I tried, I was determined not to get the shot. My family was determined not to get the shot. Uh, my mom, dad, my brother, uh, we was all, we're, we wasn't getting the shot and I didn't want my daughter to get the shot because I heard rumors about not being able to have kids. But you think about this, if, if I told my daughter which I told her not to get the shot and she didn't get the shot and she was, the roles were reversed and she was laying up there in that hospital like me. Could you live with yourself if, if she didn't, if just being up there or if she didn't make it, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't live with myself. Uh, it, you know, when I went in, like I said, no one had the shot when I got out. My whole family had the shot, and it's. Uh, I hope everyone gets the shot because you you don't want to take it home to your family. If you take it home to your, I mean, just imagine you take it home to your kids, or your parents, or your grandparents, uh, and something happens to them. I mean, it's rough. And um, like I said, I, I was on a. I, I had to be on a feeding tube. I lost 110 pounds uh, while I was in there. Uh, I lost all my muscle. I couldn't. I had to learn to walk again. Uh, everything that you you know that you it's you don't even think about doing. You, you know, I had to learn to do again. I had, you know couldn't go up steps. Couldn't walk. Uh, I had to go to rehab. I'm still rehabbing it. You know, it's it's uh, it's a long battle and I don't want anyone to have to go through what what I went through. Um, so. Uh, that's pretty much my story. Uh, this, I, I, you know, it's your right to do whatever you want to do. If you don't want to get the shot, I, I don't look down on you or I don't look down on you if you get the shot. Uh, it's, it's your choice. It's free country. Uh, but I'm just saying that everyone should get the shot. If you can save one life, uh, it's worth it. Well, Christopher, I, are you back to me, Jordan? Christopher, I, I've, I've not ever talked with you before and, uh, if your testimony doesn't touch all of our hearts, I don't know what does. But uh, I've never met you before, but I'm, I'm, I'm very, very, very happy and hopeful for your complete recovery. And, uh, and, and, and I'm really, you know, it takes a big man to stand up and, uh, you know, and to give us a story. But, uh, but anyway, Christopher, thank you again. And I pray in every way for your speedy health and recovery and, and, uh, and, and all the goodness for your family. So... Thank you again for coming on. Took a lot of courage. Appreciate you, sir. All right. Thank you. Okay. If I could switch now, we've, uh, we've lost 28 additional West Virginians since the last Friday. This could very well be uh, a little bit of a lag over the, over the weekend. It could be greater than this, but, uh, but 
you know, thank goodness I'm not sitting here having to read 110 names to you, and I hope and pray that this is even inflated a little bit, you know, but, uh, but nevertheless, uh, the 4,107th death in West Virginia is a 71-year-old male from Preston County, the 4,108th death, a 93-year-old male from Tucker County, the 4,109th death, an 85-year-old male from Lewis County, the 4,110th death, a 73-year-old male from Wood County, the 4,111th death, an 89-year-old female from Preston County, the 4,112th death, a 53-year-old female from Wetzel County, the 4,113th death, a 38-year-old female from Logan County, the 4,114th death, a 56-year-old male from Wood County, the 4,115th death, a 63-year-old female from Marion County, the 4116th death, an 86-year-old male from Jackson County. The 4117th death, a 73-year-old male from Kanawha County. The 4118th death, a 68-year-old male from Tucker County. The 4119th death, a 59-year-old male from Wood County. The 4120th death, a 78-year-old male from Marion County. The 4121st death, an 84-year-old male from Kanawha County. The 4122nd death, a 80-year-old male from Berkeley County. The 4123rd death, a 79-year-old male from Work County. The 4124th death, an 89-year-old female from Fayette County. The 4125th death, a 53-year-old male from Putnam County. The 4126th death, a 77-year-old male from Harrison County. The 4127th death, a 41-year-old female from Cabell County. The 4,128th death, a 93-year-old male from Hancock County. The 4,129th death in West Virginia, a 93-year-old male from Wayne County. The 4,130th death, a 52-year-old male from Berkeley County. The 4,131st death, a 71-year-old female from Wayne County. The 4,132nd death, a 57-year-old male from Berkeley County. The 4,133rd death, a 46-year-old male from Kanawha County. And the 4,134th death in West Virginia is an 83-year-old male from Nicholas County. Who would ever believed it? Who would ever believed we would, have lost, we would have lost General Powell to COVID? A pandemic. Who would have ever believed the testimony that Christopher just gave us? Or who in the world would have ever believed we'd have lost 4,134 great West Virginians? Prayers. Prayers will get us through this. We've got 9,033 active cases in West Virginia. You know, the, uh, our daily positivity rate is at 8.08. Our cumulative rate is at 6.06. We've got recovered cases of almost 250,000 people in West Virginia. Our hospitalizations are continue to drop slowly. We're down to 746 that are hospitalized, 218 are in the ICU, and 136 are on ventilators. Overwhelmingly, the number of people that are hospitalized are unvaccinated. Almost Christopher's story over and over and over. However, however, the, the, the number of vaccinated continues to crawl up just little by little. There's no guarantees. There's no guarantees here. If you don't have your booster shot right now and you're 18 and above and you are, you are out from your first shot and you were given Pfizer the first go round and you don't have your booster shot, you're really making a mistake. You need to go get that booster shot. It'll lower the amount that are hospitalized. It'll help us there. It'll take the pressures off our hospitals, but it could very well save your life. We got two green counties. We got 56 county school, out, or school outbreaks in 22 counties. 646 are confirmed cases in our schools. The only two schools without a mask mandate are Pocahontas and, and Tucker. And, uh, and now I'm going to turn to an announcement that is an incredible announcement. And, you know, it's hard to believe that Christmas is right around the corner, isn't it? Well, 
there's some great work that's being done by two organizations and, well, really three if you throw in communities, communities and schools, but, but there's great work by a lot of different organizations across the state. We created Jobs and Hope, and then along the way, Game, changer, game Changers came along and they, they, they said that they'd like for me to be their head coach, and I agreed to do so. Well, now we've got a situation to where, you know, that, that between Jobs and Hope and Game Changers, and Game Changers really, I think, led the way. This is the second straight year, though, that we're going to have a Change Their Holiday promotion. The goal is to raise money, raise money for families that are recovering from opioid and substance abuse and provide them with financial means to some way, somehow, really enjoy Christmas. Now, I don't know how it gets any better than that. I really and truly don't. And these, we've got two beautiful ladies here from Jobs and Hope, and we've got a, you know, a guy's okay, I guess, looking guy, you know, from, from Game Changers, and Joe, and uh, Joe Bozick, and, and, you know, and, and I, I, I just think they've, they've done great, great work you know, it's really, it was a real honor for me to be a, an advocate and, and kind of the, the start up from the standpoint of Jobs and Hope. You know, we've got, uh, you know, communities and schools that's right behind them. It's doing great work in, in all that kind of ties right in together. But, uh, you know, the Jobs and Hope started with Jim's dream. And then we couldn't put my name to it, so we changed the name to Jobs and Hope, which is fine. But really and truly, what they're doing is really they are changing lives. And now Game Changers. Game Changers is really, really moving the needle. And so, so with all this, we're going to ask people, we're going to do a promotion from now until Friday, November the 26th, to provide families that are in recovery a complete holiday, you know, right all the way down to the turkey dinner and everything else. You know, we're asking people to step up, step up, and especially at Christmas, especially at Christmas, try to do anything and everything we can to where we can blow the roof off here. You know, these great organizations are doing tremendous work, but really and truly, it all boils down to an individual, a family. Absolutely, it, that's exactly what it boils down to. And so if we can't step up in West Virginia and do greatness at Christmas time, I don't know what's wrong with us. So I'm going to, I guess I'm going to turn it over now to Joe and, and then we're going to pass to these great ladies over to my right. And, uh, you know, and, but uh, Joe, take it up, take over. Governor, thank you very much. You know, during this t tough time during the pandemic, um, you know, it's our hope and, and I know that Jobs and Hope's hope that we can provide some type of ray of sunshine. And you know, last July 29th, I was privileged to come here uh, when you agreed to be the head coach. And I can sincerely tell you, being maybe somewhat cognizant of the nature of the job of being a governor and the criticism that comes at, from all walks in different areas with that job, um, you know, I was so aware of your success as a basketball coach and success uh, that you had on the hardwood. And when we asked you to be the head coach, I did so with the hope that you would help us and lead us to the kind of success in these uh, endeavors and this initiative that you had had um, on the basketball court. And, and I can tell you this last year and a half, you have not let us down at all. Um, as like a coach, you, you provided leadership, direction, guidance, patience, and compassion through this uh, building of this team that, that you're overseeing. And, you know, you mentioned community and schools. They've set the mark of what they've done already with 31 counties and thousands of kids being helped under the first lady and her staff's guidance. And we hope that we're going to be able to simulate that uh, under your leadership. Um, we've been able to put together a team from uh, Clayton Birch over at Superintendent of Schools and Bill Crouch at DHHR and uh, Christina Mullins and the PLOs and Help and Hope West Virginia and Matt Christensen. I think we've given you probably the toughest schedule you're probably going to have to play in this game because it's certainly going to be 
a little probably more difficult in some of the games that you've coached because this is a very, very difficult opponent that we have. And it has so many tentacles, and we're so privileged to have so many people that are joining and helping us. Um, and the fact that you have shown the leadership that you have and that you've allowed us the leeway to continue to try to expand and the fortunate we have with Lori Smith over here from Jobs and Hope and Deb Harris and that whole staff that we've been able to combine. And, um, you know, there can be nothing sadder than a little one getting up on Christmas morning with little or anything underneath the Christmas tree because mom and dad are trying to get through opioids and don't have the resources to be able to provide Santa Claus coming to the house. And if we can brighten up like we did last year, um, you know, we have some sponsors that in Walmart and McDonald's and Pepsi and Aetna Better Health of West Virginia, Parmar Mountaineer Marts, NVB Bank, they, they've all stepped up to help this endeavor and Lori and her staff have helped to identify the families. Um, you know, I could go on and on, but I just want to thank you, Governor, because you've led us to this and we've just started. We're only in the first quarter. And uh, like I said, it's probably one of the toughest schedules we're going to play, but I think we're going to beat them. Well, it's easy. It's easy to be a good coach when you've got good players. I promise you that. And uh, we've got some real, real, real good ones, that's for sure. So, uh, you know, Lauren and Deb, you know, you guys talk. Tell us all kinds of good stuff. Thank you, Governor, and thank you, Joe. Um, we're very excited to be involved in the Game Changers Change Their Holiday Initiative again this year. Um, as the Governor mentioned, Jobs and Hope West Virginia was introduced during the 2019 legislative session as his idea as, of Jim's dream, and then it was supported with funding through the West Virginia Legislature. We started working with participants in 2019 with the goal of helping West Virginians eliminate barriers to career employment. We have 21 transition agents who work across West Virginia to help participants eliminate those barriers. Some barriers they face may be identifying and funding training and education opportunities, establishing reliable transportation, assistance with driver's license reimbursement, or assistance resolving justice-involved issues. To date, we have 221 participants who have eliminated those barriers, who have achieved career employment, are now considered graduates of Jobs and Hope. 548 have gotten their driver's license fully reinstated, and over 1,500 have become employed as a result of Jobs and Hope. This may not be their career employment, but they're well on their way of earning that in their lives. We also have assisted 13 in completing the expungement process. Our target population are West Virginians struggling to re-enter the workforce. They may be re-entering from long-term treatment and recovery um, from substance misuse. They may be re-entering the community for corrections or justice-involved backgrounds, or be experiencing long-term unemployment for a number of reasons. We have a great network of state partners that allow us to provide these supports. Game Changer has been a great partner and has helped Jobs and Hope make a number of employment connections. Our involvement in last year's Change Their Holiday initiative was inspiring. We were able to help 20 families have a brighter Christmas, and we look forward to helping even more this year. If you or anyone you know has a barrier to career employment and would like to be referred to the Jobs and Hope program, you can go to our website at jobsandhope.com .wv.gov and click start your journey to begin the referral process. And if I could, just a moment, um, since I have the microphone, I would like to um, give a personal COVID testimony to support the governor's message. We listen to the governor's briefings every time he's on, and I want to support the message of receiving your vaccine, getting your vaccine. Um, about two weeks ago, he announced a 21-year-old that died of COVID. That was my best friend's son. And we watched him battle for almost a week for his life in the hospital with the same tubes that Christopher had. Um, it's an amazing story for Christopher to be able to say he's here with us today um, because Luke was not that lucky. And he didn't receive a vaccine. He didn't have a belief one way or the other. He just didn't get around to it. So please don't let that be your child. Please 
make sure your children receive the vaccine, you re receive the vaccine, so that no other family has to go through that. Well, Lori, I didn't know that at all and everything, and that's, uh, that's hard to believe, isn't it, really? Really and truly. It's unreal. It's really, really, really bad. Well, listen, thank you all so much. Y'all are doing great work. You really are, all of you. And I, I, thank you, I, Governor. I just, all I'd say is just pour it on. And if we helped 20 last year, for God's sakes, living, let's help 200 this year. I mean, let's just knock it out of the park. So uh, let me go back to this. You know, I've got, you know, and we'll just go through these pretty quickly. But uh, the reminder, again, if you're 65 and older and you have any symptoms whatsoever, get tested. Just get tested. That's all there is to it. You know, uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, and, and, uh, and, and I don't mean this to just scare the people that are right up here with me, but, uh, you know, I'm not feeling very good today. I'm going to probably get tested again. I've probably been tested over and over and over. It's free. It's free for crying out loud. If you don't feel good, get tested. Antibodies will save your lives if this by chance would, would happen to be that. You know, from the standpoint of, in big crowds, you know, if you're 65 and older and you've got any kind of symptom, you know, situation like diabetes or lung problems or heart problems or stuff like that, you ought to really think really hard about wearing a mask if you're going inside to a big crowd. You know, from the standpoint of uh, total vaccinations, we're up to 66% now that have had one shot that are 12 and older. You know, that's the total population that we can vaccinate. We're at 81.4% of those 50 and older and 91.7% of those 65 and older. The 50 and older and the 65 and older are telling us the exact thing to do. They're telling us that they are, with their wisdom, get vaccinated. You know, from the standpoint of our booster shots, I've already told you, but, but if you're 18 and above and you're fully vaccinated and you're six months out from when you got vaccinated the last time and you've taken Pfizer, you absolutely would be crazy, crazy, not to go get your booster shot. Vaccine eligibility is 12 and above. The young people, we need to get more and more and more vaccinated. Our grand families need to stand up and help us in every way and take advantage of that $150 school voucher and everything. There's 19,000 kids with our grand families and they can really help us get those kids vaccinated. Everything's up on our vaccine info line, you know, all the stuff on free testing and everything. Take advantage, take advantage, take advantage. Fruith and Walgreen, we thank you from way back. I remind you again about your flu vaccine. You can get that with your COVID shot. It is absolutely safe to do so. And the last thing I keep reminding people over and over and over, we got $200 million that can go out to people that are renting or landlords, and we've sent out less than 50 million, a quarter of it. We're looking for people to apply if, you, or if you're having a lot of trouble and you're a renter, or you're having a lot of trouble collecting rent from renters and you're a landlord, and you think you're, you could be eligible, at least check it out and give us a call and let us walk you through it. And we may very well be able to help out when things are a little bit tough. And if we can, that just puts more money into the West Virginia, in West Virginians' hands, and, in, and, it, and, and the multiplier effect of those dollars is always beneficial to West Virginia. So give us a call if you're a renter or a, or a landlord and you, you know, you, you're, you're stumbling because of whatever the reason may be. Anyway, nevertheless, that's all I've got. All right, thank you, Governor. Let's now go to Dr. Clay Marsh, our coronavirus czar. Good morning. As the governor has said, as well as um, our panelists, very important for people to continue to move toward full vaccination and boosters if you're eligible. The Food and Drug Administration met last week and decided to recommend basically the same indications as they did for the Pfizer vaccine, now for the Moderna vaccine, which is in people over 65 years old, six months or greater, from their last shot of Moderna, uh, or people between 18 and 65 years old with other predisposing health problems that may make them at risk for more severe disease, and people in occupations that would expose them to people with disease. 
the dose of the Moderna vaccine was assessed and, and, and would be half the dose of the two first uh, vaccines, which is 50 micrograms instead of 100 micrograms. Um, and we're still waiting for the recommendations from the CDC and the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which will happen this week, to get the more specifics. The other thing that the FDA assessed was the benefit of having a second booster dose for people that had the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And the initial recommendation was a second Johnson & Johnson dose. But there is data that's recently been published that suggests that a second dose of a messenger RNA vaccine, Moderna or Pfizer, gives a higher number of antibodies, which is the protective factor the vaccines induce, um, than does a second dose of Johnson & Johnson. So we're also waiting to see if the mixing of vaccines will be recommended. That is called heterologous vaccinations uh, versus homogenous vaccinations, which are two of the same dose. And in the Johnson & Johnson trial, Two doses of Johnson & Johnson gave a three to five-fold increase in, in antibodies. A second dose of Pfizer with the first dose of Johnson & Johnson gave about a 35 times uh, number of antibodies. And a second dose with Moderna gave a 76-fold uh, increase in antibody production. So we're waiting to see that. The other thing at the end of the month, the uh, uh, Food and Drug Administration will meet about five to 11 year old vaccines with Pfizer's being the only candidate that's been put forward. This is also a different dose of the vaccine. It's 10 micrograms versus the standard dose for 12 and old, older uh, Americans being uh, 30 micrograms of the, of the Pfizer vaccine. So that will come to the FDA and then following will go to the CDC. As the governor has said, and as we've heard, we also know that still um, the vaccines are by far the most protective factor that we have in reducing uh, COVID-19 hospitalizations, ICU admissions, ventilator usage, and death. And it's something that all West Virginians should strongly consider, particularly as we've seen uh, Colin Powell uh, who uh, has been a, a towering American for many people, die of uh, complications of COVID-19. And as we go forward, we also very heavily recommend that people that qualify for boosters, please get those as soon as you're eligible to do so, um, because we know that the uh, potency of some of the antibodies do fade with time. And with the uh, high inoculum dose of the Delta variant of COVID-19, again, up to a thousand fold higher in droplets and, and aerosols that can promote infection, that we want people to have the maximum protection so that uh, you don't have the fates that we've heard from some of the people. The governor has read names we've, he's read at the beginning of each press brief we've done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marsh. Retired Major General Jim Hoyer, Dr. Ayn Amjad, and Secretary Bill Crouch are also joining us today and are available for questions. We'll now go to questions from members of the media. The first today from Kenny Bass with WCHS and Fox 11. Hi, thank you for taking a moment for my question. Uh, my question is probably for Dr. Marsh. If you could talk about uh, with the uh, several hospitals in the Charleston area already reporting seeing um, multiple cases of flu, uh, the twin demic that we face at this time of year with COVID and with um, the flu introducing itself during the flu season about getting the vaccines for both because of uh, what can happen if, if COVID and the flu combine and uh, what could be some of the possible results from that. Thank you. Dr. Marsh, please. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Kenny. So as we've said several times on, on this brief, it is safe and even recommended for people if you're getting your COVID vaccination, whether it's a first or a second dose, if you have the mRNA vaccines or booster dose, it is safe. Uh, and we would suggest getting a flu shot at the same time. You would just need to go and, and get the vaccines in different arms, but the vaccines are safe to be taken together. There's data from a United Kingdom study to show that the vaccines are both quite um, 
um, active uh, when, that, when used together and don't seem to increase side effects of either vaccine. If you're not scheduled to get a COVID vaccination, then it is also very important for people to get a flu vaccine. As we have pointed out, and as Kenny has just insinuated, because last year was a very, very mild flu year for us, and because many people were wearing masks and staying physically separated, we are very concerned about the impact of flu and the Delta variant of COVID-19 as a double challenge to some of our most vulnerable people. And since these are both uh, respiratory uh, processes that can interfere with lung function and oxygenation, then we're worried that we might see an even more severe impact this year of influenza, both um, independent and codependent with COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. Next, we'll go to Charles Young with WV News. Hi, this is Charles Young with WV News. Uh, my question is for Secretary Crouch. I was hoping we could get an update on the Save Our Cares program. Have we gotten the September data that we were looking for? And how did the first round of payment disbursement go last week? Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, yes, all of those funds uh, went out uh, last week to all hospitals. I uh, spoke with the uh, head of the uh, West Virginia Hospital Association this morning about the September data. Uh, we're looking to get that data as soon as I can get that together. It took a little while last month. Uh, we hope there's a, a better understanding now of what we need in terms of the second phase of these fund, uh, these funds going out. But, uh, but everything went out uh, last week as scheduled. I think those were electronic fund transfers, so uh, those uh, those are sometimes delayed a day or two by the banks. But uh, it's my understanding everybody have not heard that anyone did not get those funds. Uh, so we uh, we plan on the same approach here as soon as we get the September data. Thank you, Carol. Thanks, Charles. Next to Mark Curtis with the Next Star Media. Good afternoon, uh, Governor, and uh, or good morning still, Cabinet members. And uh, Governor, I just want to let you know I successfully got out of that elevator the other day. Um, I just been uh, on vacation for a couple of days. Uh, listen, I want to ask about herd immunity. With um, 65 plus, we have 81 percent fully vaccinated now, 12 plus, 58 percent fully vaccinated in all eligible, 66 percent at least one shot. Are we getting closer to this concept of herd immunity or is that really just a concept or is it a real thing scientifically? Well, you know, Mark, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're sharing elevator stories and that's that's not real good. But uh, but nevertheless, uh, Mark, here's what I would say. I would say at being at 66% again, you know, and, and, and continuing to go north, even though it may be slow, and being at 91.7% of the 90 year old, uh, the 65 and olders, and, and being at 81.4 or whatever it was of the, uh, of the uh, 50 and olders, we're getting there, aren't we? You know, in all honesty, it'd be really difficult to argue all the different things that we did, whether it was do it for baby dog round one, two, the testimonials, you know, the great work that Game Changers, Jobs and Hope, and all those people that are doing and telling us over and over, we got to get vaccinated. You know, sure, sure it's tough. Sure it's really tough. But we're getting there, aren't we? Now, unfortunately, you know, we continue to lose a lot of people and everything, but we're, we're making progress. And, you know, Mark, it's impossible to argue that. The, uh, the other thing is just this, is are we at a point in time where we have enough, you know, immunity from, the, from those that have recovered? Are we getting to a point in time where absolutely we're going to be able to take hold of this thing? Well, we think but we also hope and pray, you know, and, uh, and so, so every day that goes by, we just keep digging in, in right in the face of all the adversity and everything where people are throwing rocks and saying, well, this isn't working, this isn't doing, you, know, you ought to just don't even do anything. You ought not even have the briefing. We keep digging and we're making progress and everything. And we really do believe that we are getting closer and closer to a number to where this thing, we can control this thing. 
Instead of this thing controlling us and the tail wagging the dog, it's time for the dog to wag the tail. And so, so with all that, uh, you know, we're going to continue to work. That's all I know to do. Great. Thank you, Mark. Next to Paul Mullen with WCBC. Good morning, Governor. Good morning, panel. Uh, Governor, I want to go in the opposite direction of where you were going. I'm noticing the graphs, and they are showing that downward uh, part of the curve taking place now, which would be good news. But I also read the weather forecast today, and uh, I have a frost advisory in effect tonight for my part of the state. So that means people are going to be going indoors. I, I'd like to get the medical people to weigh in, and maybe even the general, too on uh you know people going indoors and with the delta variant out there what particular danger that presents this year that we did not face last year thank you well paul before they go let me just say just this i have said it over and over and over bad weather's coming we're going to be indoors more and this delta variant is in multiples of times more infectious we, not, we know every bit of that, don't we? That's why I have been pleading, pleading, especially with our parents and our grandparents to get our kids vaccinated, our kids in schools vaccinated. You know, we want to all be vaccinated. I get all of that and everything. And, 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 and I totally, totally understand, totally understand and stand rock solid behind the fact that if, if you, it is your choice, it is your choice. In my opinion, you know, especially if you have a medical or religious reason, employers ought not to be able to just, you know, decide, well, just because, you know, I think, you know, that we're, we, we need to all be vaccinated and you really genuinely have a medical reason why you are not going to take the vaccine or a religious feeling or belief that you're not going to take the vaccine, we ought to respect that. We absolutely, and that's my feeling. I don't want to impose that on anybody, but that's how I feel. But you know, Paul, the, uh, you know, I am not a doctor, so maybe it'd be better for, for us to have the medical community weigh in. But Dr. Marsh, maybe you can go and, in general, or Dr. Amjad, is Dr. Amjad with us today? Yeah, she, sure, sure. So, so let them go. Thank you, Governor. I'll lead it off and then pass the baton. You know, Paul, I think this is a really important point and we are always concerned about colder weather that brings people together indoors. As the governor said many times, the most uh, important protection that we can give is through full vaccination and, you know, um, and booster dose if, if and when eligible. Certainly people that are elderly or people that have pre-existing health problems that puts them at risk should consider um, you know, other mitigation measures like wearing a mask when they're indoors around a lot of other people or people that they don't know. We talked about the dangers of influenza as a coexistent virus. And there are other viruses that can affect the lungs that are also you know, potentially problematic during a winter time uh, surge. So ultimately we would suggest vaccination is the primary issue, but also to take good care and judge your own um, environment and make sure that you're protecting yourself as we've talked about from the very beginning of the pandemic because other mitigation measures that we've talked about that reduce the risk of respiratory uh, transmission of viruses are certainly effective for COVID, for influenza, and for other respiratory viruses that you might encounter this week, this uh, winter. Hi. Thanks. Um, the, the only thing that I would add is that if you are feeling sick, um, you know, whether you think it's COVID or the flu, it, it to go get tested before you join any events indoors with family or friends. You know, it's so easy to go get a COVID test. We still have free testing sites. Um, you can get tested for the flu, strep, anything easily now. So before you go, into an indoor event with your family and friends and you're not feeling well, you know, you can get tested before or, or stay home if you're not feeling well. But that's the only additional thing I would add to what Clay mentioned. Thanks. All right, thank you, Paul. Governor, I'll turn it back to you. Well, today is a really, really important day. You know, like I said, tomorrow is a day that uh, is my mom's birthday and uh, a day that I'll remember forever. 
but I'll probably remember this day forever too. We lost an absolute superhero. I ask for your prayers for General Colin Powell, you know, an absolute superstar that gave so much to this country, it's unbelievable, and gave it with a tone of goodness, did he not? I mean, he didn't give it with a, a tone of uh, partisan politics. He didn't give it with a tone of, uh, you know, an authoritarian type person. He gave it with a tone of trust and love and truth. You know, and, uh, and we'll miss him. We'll miss him, and it's a tragedy beyond belief that we've lost him to COVID. You know, it's just, it's just hard to imagine. Wounded twice, absolutely lose him of a pandemic. It's really, really sad. You know, and, not, and right behind that, and surely not even behind, we've lost 4,134 people in West Virginia. I can't possibly tell you the wisdom that we've lost. You know, Lori shared with us her best friend lost a 21-year-old son. A 21-year-old son that really wasn't opposed to taking the vaccine, just really just like all kids would be, just really just hadn't gotten around to it. And this thing got him. And it really can get all of us you know, we got to really be careful. We really, really should take heed to the fact of getting vaccinated. We should be respectful and loving to one another. And what has really gotten us through this whole thing is we've stayed together some way, somehow. We've had different opinions, but some way, somehow, we've not fragmented in West Virginia. That's how we've gotten through this. And if anybody believes any differently, they're nut jobs. At the end of the day, we've gotten through this together, together. We didn't get through this as Republicans or Democrats. We didn't get through this as black, white, rich, poor. We got through this as West Virginians, loving one another and pulling the rope together. Don't impose your feelings on anyone. Absolutely, but, be, but everyone should be respectful of each and every one. You know, the good book tells us over and over to love your neighbor. And really and truly, at this time in West Virginia, you've done that. You've really done that, and you really made me really proud. This could have been, you know, what Tom Floyd in South Carolina would have called an 18-carat dog's mess, and it could have really been. Where we were, the third oldest state, with all these chronic illnesses and the most vulnerable of all states, and not protected by any great lake or ocean, there we sit within a rock throw of two-thirds of the population of this country, and absolutely we could have had a disaster beyond belief. But you did it. You kept together. You pulled the rope. And that's why our numbers, even though they're tragic in many ways, that's why they're as good as they are. So just keep it up. Keep up loving one another, and at the, end, at the same time be respectful of one another, and please, please, please really consider being vaccinated. It's the only bullet I've gotten a gun. If I had any other, any other means, I'd tell you. But absolutely, please get vaccinated. Thank you so much.